policy and regulation gaps and Nigeria's proposed marginal fields licensing round and also looking at an outsider's perspective when it comes to investing in Nigeria. So just a very quick things uh, just to run through. It's going to be a one hour, 15 minute session. We will have uh, 10 minute presentations from each of our panelists followed by a Q&A session. However, I would like to stress that this is going to be an interactive session. So I will encourage you all to make use of the chat button at the bottom of the screen or is it the right of the screen? Yes, at the bottom um, of the screen and uh, drop in your questions as we go along. Uh, and then I shall pass these on to the panel. Now we'll also be putting our polling questions in the chat box uh, throughout the session. So please look out for that and we will point these out to you as we go along. And I'd like to start by uh, quickly introducing our hosts. Okay, so our host today, we've got the Petroleum uh, Club, Lagos, as I said at the very start, and Energy Institute, um, after which I'll then introduce our esteemed panelists. So let me start with the Petroleum Club. The uh, Petroleum Club is a non-trading professional association of leaders and key stakeholders in Nigeria's oil and gas industry. The club plays a key role as a think tank an advocacy group and an important contributor in the oil and gas industry's policy framework. Its members interact, contribute to national policy formulation while promoting the interest of the industry at large. There's also the Energy Institute, EI. Energy Institute is the professional membership body bringing global energy expertise together. The Institute gathers and shares essential knowledge about energy, the skills that are helping us use it more wisely and the good practice that keeps it safe and secure. EI articulates the voice of energy experts taking the know-how of its over 30,000 members from 120 countries to the heart of the public debate. Before I go on to introduce the panel, I'd like to welcome Yewande Abiyose, the Managing Director of the Energy Institute in Nigeria branch. Yewande, I know you'd like to make a very quick comment. Hello, Judy, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Energy Institute, I'd like to welcome you to the Energy Dialogue. This is the first edition and we are organizing this in partnership with the Petroleum Club. The Energy Institute is proud to have developed a range of monthly webinars which will replace our evening sessions and lunch and learns. This we typically do in Lagos and Port Harcourt. The aim of the virtual dialogue is to keep you up to date with industry trends and also help you engage with thought um, leaders within the sector. The themes and topics of the energy dialogue would cut across the different sectors. So oil, gas, renewables, and power. We'll also make sure that they span across the different disciplines. As you know, the Energy Institute takes um, different disciplines very seriously because we believe that most of the problems we face as a sector, it is not specific to one particular discipline. For example, our next session focuses on capacity building within the context of local content. Business disruptions due to COVID-19 has prompted industry stakeholders to look inward and leverage on local strengths and expertise. At this dialogue, speakers within West Africa will discuss and exchange thoughts on how we can overcome capacity limitations in order to foster sustainable economic development. I encourage you all to join us on the 10th of June as we further discuss this theme. Also, I want to highlight that the Energy Institute's trainings are now available online. So if you would like to take part in any of them, please go to the website and check out our virtual catalog. I would also like to encourage our members to take time out to focus on their professional development. These are quieter times, and I think this is the best time to actually see how you can develop yourself. We have a committee dedicated to this, so they're happy to support you as you grow. Before I hand over to you, Didi, um, I'd also like to say a special thank you to our distinguished speakers. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. We really do appreciate you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining us. I hope you find the dialogue very interesting and informative. We look forward to hosting you again very soon. Thank you. All right, thank, thanks so much for that, uh, Yoande. 
Okay, so I'd now like to welcome our esteemed panelists. We have a very strong panel with vast experience and scope of the industry, and they will talk policy, the operating environment, finance, and the investment climate. So uh, honored to have with us Mr. Austin Olorishola. He is a professional petroleum geologist, technologist, development planner, and economist, and a commercial gas and power expert with over 35 years of practice and experience. He spent over two decades at Shell International, where he retired as vice president for Sub-Saharan Africa. Mr. Lorenzo is a fellow of the Energy Institute and currently serves as the chairman of the Energy Institute Nigeria branch. He's also a pioneer member of the Petroleum Club Lagos. So thank you very much for joining us. Next up, we have Dr. Olai Wola Francis Fatona. He's an entrepreneurial petroleum geologist with over 46 years of oil industry experience. Most recently, he retired as the founding and managing director, Niger Delta Group of Companies. He currently retains the position of vice chairman of the board of ND Western Limited. He's also on the board of governors of the Petroleum Club Lagos. Welcome, sir. Next up is Ifoma Fini. Ifoma is an investment banker and senior vice president within the Debt Solutions Unit at FBN Quest Merchant Bank. She has over 10 years of banking experience, the last seven of which have been dedicated primarily towards financial advisory structuring and closing of project finance deals worth over $6 billion across sectors such as oil and gas infrastructure and telecommunications. Then we have William Pollard. William joined Invest in Africa as the program director at its inception in 2012 and has since overseen IIA's expansion and its entry into Ghana and subsequent growth into Kenya and other new markets. IIA's vision is to create a thriving African economies by connecting corporates to credible local African SMEs and giving those SMEs better access to skills, markets, and finance. And lastly, I'd like to welcome our moderator of this uh, webinar, Mrs. Cecilia Umore. Ms. Umore is the Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer of Millennium Oil and Gas Company Limited. She is also on the board of Walter Smith Petromam Oil Limited. Ms. Zumare is on the board of governors of the Petroleum Club Lagos, and she's also a member of the Energy Institute. So I'd like to pass on now to uh, Mrs. Zumare so we can start uh, this session. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Yewande and Didi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to moderate this panel of uh, seasoned professionals and respected industry thought leaders. Some of these people I know quite uh, well. So um, this year, 2020, is a turning point in humanity. When Elizabeth II described year 1992 as Annus horribilis, but I reckon she never imagined year 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic, as you all know, has caused a health and humanitarian crisis, which combined with an oil demand disruption and supply glut, formed a perfect storm that plunged us into unprecedented crisis and devastated our economy. All futures were actually trading at negative indices at one point. We all know that this industry is used to long mega cycles of supply and demand. And we have, in fact, experienced three oil price uh, collapses in the past 12 years. And we have always recovered. But this time, no analyst can predict what form recovery will take. Most of us have been on lockdown for some time. And it's as if a pause button was pressed. And this has allowed us time to, for introspection and recalibration. It's obvious that since this is a global crisis, that there are some issues we may have to resolve in collaboration with the global community. 
But ultimately, countries such as our own country, Nigeria, must chart their own paths to recovery. The common thread in most economic recovery patterns is capital spending. Nigeria and the oil industry, which as we know is relevant to government revenue, must therefore accelerate its transformation and recovery efforts through policies that serve as catalyst to economic stimulation and growth. It is said that every crisis is an opportunity that must not be ignored or wasted. Um, various webinars have highlighted the new business opportunities that, and gaps that exist in the entire oil and gas value chain. But this also raises the question, is this a good time? for bold strategic investments and capital reallocation? Or is it better to hang on to cash and err on the side of caution? So I'm going to be looking to my um, panelists to unravel the complexities of the decision whether or not to invest in Nigeria at this time. And um, one of the things we're going to do, we've decided that the, um, we're going to take the process of having all the panelists speak at once. We'll allot 10 minutes to each panelist. After that, we'll go straight to question and answers. And like um, Didi has said, in between, we'll be conducting a poll. So please, I urge you to um, participate in the poll. And I urge you also to start sending in your questions as soon as possible. Didi or Yewande will be curating the questions. So I'm going to go straight to Mr. Oloran Shola. Um, Austin, the industry is entering an era of intense competition for investable funds. So it's expected that government will be introducing policies to incentivize investors. So let me put you on the spot and ask you, what policies do you think government should be putting in place at this time? or what policies have they actually put in place at this time? Also, the petroleum industry bill, the insurmountable petroleum industry bill was introduced to the National Assembly uh, in 2008. And um, up until now, we have only managed to pass the governance bill in uh, 2018. So could you kindly tell us what is the current status of that bill? And then finally, um, government announced that it will conduct a marginal field bid round this year. So my question and the question of most other people, I, I think, is this plan still realistic? And uh, I mean, we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic and there's a global recession looming, or we've, we've actually entered a global recession. So is this a realistic time to be having a marginal bid round. Is this insensitive of government? So, um, Mr. Lawrence Shola, over to you. You have a lot packed into your first 10 minutes. Um, we can't see Mr. Lawrence Shola, at least I can't see Mr. Lawrence Shola. We can see him, he just needs to unmute himself. Okay. So okay. Can you see and hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you, we can see you now. Excellent, and I just say again that uh, good afternoon uh, and thanks for inviting me to at least hear my views on, on this topic. I've also been on lockdown just like yourself, and I think um, Ms. Alonjola is very happy for that. Uh, not for any reason other than the fact that I travel so much. Um, so foremost, let me wish you all very well, and I just hope that you all continue to uh, keep safe uh, and, and, and very well. Um, this uh, pandemic is 
truly a very, very different one. Uh, so nobody should uh, think that it is um, similar to any other thing uh, 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 in the past. Uh, and, and frankly speaking, with all the responses we have seen so far, it is pretty clear that we are all learning on the job uh, at, at this time. Um, as far as I know, in my own very short lifetime, um, um, this is the very first time I've actually really seen health, economy, and energy all almost uh, threatened to submission all at the same, uh, at the same time. So let, let me begin with some context, uh, looking at the spectrum of, uh, if you like, the, the energy space, also as my role as an energy institute, uh, looking at the dynamics between fuels, um, how they compete also amongst themselves. Um, very few weeks ago, um, um, uh, precisely, uh, on the 27th of February, we're all uh, in IP week in London, um, and we're still looking at the outlook for oil and gas, you know, and all that. It was still looking pretty great. Uh, and little did we really realize that um, um, uh, in about three weeks after that time, oil, like oil you know, and we have all seen that. Um, and this is one of the main talking points today and, and all the questions that have been asked, uh, which I will answer very, very shortly. So let me start by emphasizing the fact that, frankly speaking, it's, and I think it's pretty clear now, that life is really meaningless uh, without energy and economy. Um, the events of last week, uh, I mean, last few weeks, I think, have fully, uh, really, really uh, reinforced and demonstrated uh, all that. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, for me, COVID-19 is truly uh, the mother of all crises. It's been a perfect cocktail for me of many crises, all kind of mingled in one. Um, if we just dissect a little bit, recall it all started like a Wuhan virus, a Wuhan flu, uh, and shortly after it became something accepted as a global health emergency. But before we knew um, what was happening, uh, it attacked the global uh, economy frontally, first reducing the demand for uh, energy and eventually destroying it. As the world was kind of grappling with some bit of panic and all that, Saudi Arabia and Russia Unfortunately, and I remarked that very well, unfortunately, true cautions to the winds, jettisoned wisdom, and chose such an auspicious time to fight for price. So that price war, frankly speaking, really didn't last more than three, four weeks. Uh, but the damage, we will see it for more than the next 60 weeks. So for oil and gas, it's been an unprecedented, uh, what I can say, destruction. Uh, very much, almost beyond repair. At some point in time, we're all very, very shaky, really. And the aggregate impact of all these, it really looked like a slow motion. If you look at it from, say, uh, March, April, May, um, five key things happened very, very quickly. The first was that there was a uh, um, um, the destruction of demand and supply for the first time. So the two were destroyed all at the same time. Second, there was a price crash. Third, there was petroleum glut, so it was everywhere. And then fourth, we started to see economic collapse. And the fifth, which um, um, our moderator just talked about, it's a slow preparation towards recession. And I dare say, some countries might actually um, um, face depression. Let's just hope and, and see how it goes. So the EIA estimates uh, a demand uh, uh, slump this year, roughly uh, 9.3 million barrels per day. Uh, 
are from the usual 100 and 102 million barrels per day. That takes us, frankly speaking, back to almost eight, nine, ten years ago. So, so all the capacities we've built in all that particular period might actually just be lying waste for a while. Uh, however, we, we are seeing also some moves to see whether we can still claw back about 4 million barrels per day of that. But really, the bottom line is that um, for the next uh, 9, 12, 18 months, uh, it's going to be a little bit of struggle. Uh, so the next slide just simply says, indeed, that what happened was that for eight weeks, six to eight weeks, uh, um, to the next slide, the earth actually really simply went closed for a test. But all of us were really all on the lockdown, and I was wondering who was doing the repairs or how they were actually really, really doing it. Um, but right now, uh, the rain is uh, uh, gradually subsiding on, until this morning, and I saw, you know, again, another serious rain you know, of a totally different dimension. And we are disembarking from the act. So all energy uh, practitioners again have gone back to work. So it really certainly looks like um, um, there will be significant idle capacity uh, till about the end of 2020 and slightly beyond. But as the world grapples to uh, accelerate recovery of that loss demand and all that, the industry has to somehow again magically begin to think of the future in terms of outlooks, especially uh, for oil and gas. It could be daunting, but I think uh, uh, there's quite a lot we can do. The good news is that um, the latest, um, uh, uh, if you like, outlook we have seen from people like say, EIA, uh, EIA, for example, is that the global uh, petroleum will rebound in about say 12 to 18 months. Uh, but this will certainly uh, require some very, very serious discipline. The first is that there has to be discipline and good behavior among like OPEC plus members um, in respecting agreements. Um, if the unfinished US-China geopolitical struggle and trade war does not become affected by the new virus on its own, uh, there's the potential for that to happen. Thirdly, within the short to medium term, uh, the low oil price will actually um, uh, help to even uh, accelerate uh, demands on its own because quite a lot of people will say, this is cheap oil, let's continue to buy it and, and use it uh, to move the economy back to normal. Um, but even in particular, transportation demand, which was really, really the most hit, we think it might quickly build back as more people move away from pool services. Um, basically, everybody is now going on single person vehicle type of a thing. So um, probably a lot of people will now use a lot of uh, oil and gas again and, and demand will, will go back. And lastly, because of the uh, weakness in, in the global economy, people may not necessarily be able to buy very new slicky stuff anymore. So uh, for me, I will stick on to my old jalopy, which basically causes a lot of foil. Um, the next slide, slide basically talks around, uh, um, again, around energy transition itself. So demand recovery outlook looks uh, quite promising. But within the overall energy spectrum, oil and gas will continue to basically struggle to maintain its own 55 to 60, 70 uh, percent space within the mix. So for Nigeria's oil and gas, we must have a very broad and long-term view of our policies and aspirations. We must fix regulations and enable the sector as a catalyst for the wider economy rather than continue to using it as a cash cow. Uh, in addition, we must keep uh, two eyes on, on uh, very open eyes on, on global energy transition, uh, working out uh, what it really means for Nigeria as well as for uh, Africa. So what are the immediate focus uh, in Nigeria? Next slide. Uh, basically, um, 
there are, as at the beginning of this year, we started with nine priorities of, uh, of government, which um, Chief Timit Prisiva basically laid out. Two are very much uh, uh, at the bon uh, on the front of the bonus at this point in time. One is the PID, which must be delivered within the next three months, and I will tell you why. Uh, and the second is, is the licensing round, uh, which uh, uh, on marginal fields, which uh, our moderator uh, talked about. That too has to be delivered within the next six months, and I'll also tell you why. So first on the PIB. So this time around, next slide, the, the PIB is uh, it's an executive bill. It's making very, very good progress. So they're packaged into uh, two volumes, uh, fiscals. It's one volume, and the others uh, 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 are the other volume. We collect um, the last um, eight assembly, we have this in four volumes so far. This is two, two volumes. It is ready to proceed to FEC uh, for clearance as well as presidential notes. Uh, thereafter, uh, to be transmitted to the National Assembly within a few weeks for a very fast tracked legislative uh, process. Include first reading, second reading, public hearing, committee deliberations, third reading, harmonization, final passage, and frankly speaking, return back again to the villa. So it's going to be really, 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 really busy three months ahead of us as far as PIB is concerned. The team is very ready. Um, there's a team that is also going to be set up to support the Nazi to get this uh, um, down in an expeditious manner. That team is going to be set up at about this same two o'clock tomorrow. Um, and so, so that the bill can be on its way back to the villa uh, of And that is why it has to be between now and three months. Next slide. Marginal fields. So with respect to marginal fields, um, I'm very much aware that it, uh, it has specific drivers, very broad objectives, uh, much beyond the traditional expansion of indigenous capacity. Um, the government, of course, additionally, uh, this time around, wants to make quite some good money uh, out of it. Uh, but unlike the typical uh, bid rounds, which usually have like two halves of it, the promotion stage or process as well as the licensing process. There will be no promotion process for this particular round uh, because of time. Uh, so um, I think as soon as the whistle is blown, everybody should start uh, running Helter Skelter. Uh, next slide um, is basically to answer one of the questions from, from, um, from our moderator, whether the time uh, is right. Last night, um, history was made again in NASA, for example, uh, and SpaceX geared towards uh, launching two people into uh, space from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, it was about it. I, I saw that uh, very much because I was very much interested. Uh, even our friend President Trump and his wife and even his vice were basically uh, physically. I think they will try. Um, if people can be doing that at this point in time, come on, talk about uh, marginal fields. So COVID pandemic, pandemic didn't stop that. So I think we should just basically go ahead. In my view, like I say here on this slide, um, the best time to have done this was probably maybe 10 years ago. Uh, but the next best time is basically now. Um, and, and simply, really, if you really consider these fields marginal, and they were given about 17, 18 years ago, if they were really then successful in terms of really development, by now all of them should be declining, you know, or even completely dead, which will make all the capacities that people have built completely useless. So this is about time to do a, another bid round. Uh, in my days as a regulator, I wanted to do it uh, in 2012. Uh, so I think, um, uh, we shouldn't even bother ourselves whether uh, the time is right uh, or wrong. And in any case, um, maybe the, the, the people really want to, those who are running with it, um, 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 yeah, 
know very well that uh, this is probably even the best time because there's only very serious contenders uh, really show up. Like they said, only eagles fly uh, in region uh, wildfires. There was also another question around the attract attractiveness at this point in time, which I'll try to show on the next slide. Um, so after about 20 years, I think we can really clearly say that that experiment of 20, 2002, 3, 4, uh, I think is relatively successful in my view. It has been successful. Uh, we now have at least 13 plus another six separate marginal field awards uh, that are operating. Uh, I'm aware 11 uh, have been revoked not too long ago. Um, uh, but the fields this time around um, uh, are more, uh, much better defined. They, they have very, very bankable volumes. They've even gone to, to the extent of independently verifying the volumes. Um, um, so, so, so they will not be caught in, in any web of uh, also of uh, OPEC cuts because um, um, hopefully the on-stream dates will be will be post uh, uh, mid mid 2021. So I, I think it's 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 um, it, it's um, it's about time. Let's let's just get get going with it. Uh, and also, besides, big producers are declining. Uh, I don't know too many FIDs today uh, that is going to come up soon. So um, uh, let's let's augment with uh, with marginal fills. There are also questions around my views on on, on the development going forward. Um, um, I will basically just simply say that you will not develop this new set of marginal fills the way you did the last ones uh, uh, twenty years ago. Uh, it's got to be based on new thinking, new philosophies, new models. Uh, this time around, I will certainly expect some real strategic cooperation and collaboration, good governance, really, really, really underpinned by world standard uh, type of professionalism. Um, there has to be some sense of urgency, not people just sitting on this, this uh, field uh, uh, as they did before. Efficiency, cost management has to really, really, really be um, uh, in my view, the way we are going right now, um, you don't, we will not need an OPEC to tell you to cut. You will cut by yourself because you, people, operators will definitely have to be sophisticated enough to know the unit cost per barrel of every barrel they get out and, and basically cut when, 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 when the price doesn't particularly uh, look good. Um, I think going forward, um, this new set of uh, awards, operators have to also look beyond the upstream, frankly speaking. In fact, I say look at the demand side of the upstream. So, uh, 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 and not just a case of uh, the usual thing we have done since 1958, take crude and send it to OECD or send it to Asia. Uh, diversification has to happen. We have to begin now to industrialize the petroleum I'm sector. Petrol, they muted me. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Shona, sorry, your time is absolutely up. Okay, and, thank uh, you. We... And I've answered most of the questions. Yes, and you, you have time for um, um, questions, to answer more questions later, so you can go into more detail. I'm afraid uh, I have some questions myself, but let's move on quickly to uh, Dr. Fatona. Okay, good. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Olonoshala. Um, Dr. Fatono, you are one of our indigenous success stories. You, along with others that I don't need to mention, we all know them. You have successfully created value for your stakeholders in Niger Delta Petroleum Resources. And as we heard, you're poised to do the same uh, at ND Western. So, um, even though um, Mr. Olon Roshola, you know, gave a good report for the 2003 bid round, but um, we, the 2013 uh, marginal bid round, sorry, but most people will say that um, they've done uh, this money, as far as I know, all the indigenous producers put together are only adding about 200,000 
barrels a day to the national production average, which is just a mere 10%. So um, you have told us now, you have assured us, he has assured us that this time around, the, the fields are more bankable. But in any case, you have done it successfully. But the truth is that the industry fundamentals have changed and the rules of engagement, so to speak, in the new world order will be definitely tougher than ever. So my question is, we, we know that change in strategy is definitely imperative. But my question is, how will you advise the, the new uh, investors? How can they create value from these assets in the new normal? How, how, do, how do we win in this new environment? How will you keep your people safe and be operating profitably at the same time? Or, are those two things mutually exclusive? I don't know. So please, uh, uh, Dr. Fatanon. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, Cecilia, and uh, thank you very much uh, to the Energy Institute, as well as the Petroleum Club uh, for creating an environment for this kind of uh, very high-end dialogue. Um, I must start by saying that uh, each bad situation presents an opportunity. And, uh, and it is in, in my very short life, even more so, uh, in many ways, in many ways more than, uh, than is obvious. But you really have to have the, the intuitive uh, capabilities to, to see opportunities, even in the, in the, in the context of ad adversity like we, we are dealing with. Um, the full manifestation of a new dogma, uh, you know, even as it presents opportunities, uh, uh, let's let's scale it down and very in a very focused manner. Let us take it in the context of the Nigerian oil and gas space. Uh, and I, I just believe, and my hunch, which is always very strong, tells me that indeed decision that Austin had uh, spoken, you know, uh, um, glowingly about that Nigeria is in now, is a very rare opportunity. And it is one that allows us to have a radical change out in both policy formulation as well as implementation. And I, and, and, uh, I was very happy to hear him boldly give a timetable for um, what will happen? And, and, and I think he speaks from, from a, a, a very, very significant position of knowledge and, uh, and involvement. So let's take it that our policy formulation will go through and it would achieve what, it, it requ it, what is required. The next thing that we have to speak to is implementation of those policies. And uh, let us think in terms of vit vital Nigerian statistics, um, which I really must address. Um, we have a very vibrant population. And, uh, and in Africa, I, I think we are very blessed. There are 200 million old Nigerians who need ample energy to drive everything in their homes, in industries, in businesses, agriculture, wherever, substantial amount of energy is required. Fortunately or unfortunately for us, at this point in time, Nigeria has no foreign exchange. And I think it's a very, very healthy state to be, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we've had it too, I mean, when there's foreign exchange to lavish, import, and do all sorts of things, this is a very opportune time when we have zilch about foreign exchange. And I see that as, 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 as an added opportunity. Uh, so what does this do to us? This creates a time. The time now is when to get Nigeria to do things differently. It is the time to look at our vast oil and gas resources and say, hey, what are we going to do with this? And when I say, what will Nigeria do? It's got to be with the sentiments of by itself, 
by Nigeria itself, for Nigeria itself, and just by a little bit of an extensionalism for the rest of Africa. And I think Nigeria is in a space now to do those things, first of all, by itself, for itself and for Africa. And I think, I think our, our slogan, at least in industry, has to change. It has to be that anything we do in the industry going forward has to be for export purposes, not the export that we are used to seeing, uh, that we have seen from 1956 when we produced the first barrel of crude oil. And we have done that religiously up till today. So our slogan should actually be zero export of anything that is related to crude oil and gas. So when I come to this slide that is, uh, that is, that is here, then brings the big question that anybody would like to ask. What do we do with the 2 million barrels of oil production that we see today? What do we do with the substantial amount of gas that goes today to burn in LNG? If we have a retrospect, the opportunity to use it. So we have to focus on the subject of investments. And when I'm talking about investment, people will ask, where is the new investment funding going to come from? The first question is, is it going to come from outside? Obviously, for now, and when I say now, it is not going to happen. And we know that new investment funding will not come from anywhere into Nigeria today. And if you ask me, where else could it come from? It's going to come from within. Now, if we go to the next slide, what are the characters of funding that we require for Nigerian investments? Primarily, it has to be long term. And it must come with guarantees of safety and rewards for whoever, even when I say the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the investment has to come from within. So many years after, uh, we have not succeeded in enacting a new PID, but I'm glad that Austin has given us uh, a very, very nice uh, ray of hope that is going to happen. And uh, the reason is that our investment environment today, as we have it, is very much new capital unfriendly. Very sadly so. And when you think in terms of new capital that we require to develop and take the Nigerian petroleum industry to, to the next level, it's got to be tailored in a way that it is new capital friendly. And today, unfortunately, it is not. Well, I would say that COVID-19 may have further negatively impacted the intent to have something uh, in place between now and June, which we are promised. But if Austin says that uh, in the next three to six months, things would move in a very accelerated manner and, uh, and, um, and, and maybe a new life will come, the recipe, therefore, will be an inward looking approach to new capital that we require to do things. And what does that do to us? How should we invest for the future, starting now? Um, I know that uh, you asked the question, um, how do we do things differently? And, uh, and uh, doing that, we have to think in any way, a very integrated production of oil and gas resources. It's got to be integrated. Therefore, you will not be able to say, I am going to do oil production alone or gas production alone. It's got to be a hybrid approach. You have to be able to take oil and gas as it occurs in nature and be able to do something meaningful with everything. That brings us to the fact that our domestic processing of oil and gas resources has to increase in many fold. We're not, we, we shouldn't be talking about what do we do with 2 million barrels of oil. I strongly believe that Nigeria should turn itself 
into an oil and gas processing hub, not just for itself, not just for its own energy needs. For the rest of West Africa, for the rest of Africa, because the market is there in this continent. And I'm a very, very strong apostle, at, or a very strong believer in that no China money is going to come to develop Africa. I think we should, we should just get this out of our minds. We are never going to get European money to come and develop Nigeria, to come and develop Africa. So we have to create Nigerian money. We have to print Nigerian money. We have to find Nigerian money that would develop Nigeria for itself, for its people, and for the rest of Africa. Now, I see so many things that, that can be done. I, I see so many things because if you look at the model that we have as a company had, 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 uh, had adopted, in a very nimble way, we have taken a small marginal field, and our story is very, 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 uh, very, very lively. When we got the field almost 15, 16, 20 years ago, the expectation was that the field contains only 5 million barrels. But by sheer brute, we looked intensely, we found more oil, and today we produce more than 90 million barrels of oil. We have delivered more than 90 BCF of gas into Bonnie and LNG. We are delivering gas to a nearby uh, uh, domestic uh, um, off-taker. We have built a refinery. So we have built from nothing, from a very small concept, a fully integrated entity. And there's no reason why this cannot be replicated because it is not, it is not rocket science. There are many other things that I strongly believe we can do. We have been faced with a situation where at the peak of the pandemic, Nigeria has about 50, 60 ships laden with Nigerian crude, nowhere to go. Why did we always find ourselves in a situation like this? I've been hearing of domestic uh, strategic reserves and storage. I don't know where it is. But this is time for us as a country to tell ourselves in a station like this, we should have the option not to sell our crude. And Dr. Fact, Fatuna, I'm sorry to have to interrupt you, but you may have to just please okay. round up. We'll come back to you with questions. Okay. The I'm questions actually, are already pouring in. Okay. I'm, I'm actually at the tail end. This is my last okay. slide. Okay. That's and good. You can see from all the things that I've enumerated on this slide, uh, we have gas based industries, gas to power. Um, chemical, um, uh, chemicals, modular refineries. The essence is to transform Nigeria as the energy hub for Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think at this point we should take maybe one or two of the polls. I missed taking one after Doctor after Mr. Lawrence Shola's presentation, so I want us to take one right away. Please, um, are you ready? Who is, who is doing the polling? Can you put up the question on the, on the screen, please? Or maybe we can do that while, um, because we're really running short of time. And I'm going to crave the indulgence of the participants. I'm going to, okay, this is the question. Is this an appropriate time to conduct the marginal field bid round? And your answer is yes or no. Please, you have just 60 seconds to, um, to call. Okay, can you quickly put up the second question? The second question, okay, if it's not ready, we'll go straight to Iforma. Um, I was saying that I'm going to crave the indulgence. I don't know if I should pull this uh, in order to give room for Q&A because we're running out of time. I may have to extend this by 10 to 15 minutes. So, okay. 
the answer to the poll, the result is out and 65% um, said, yes, this is the right time and 35% uh, said no. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to Ifoma now. We'll come back to those um, poll um, results. Ifoma, thank you for your patience. Thank you. We have always said in uh, industry that a successful operation rests on a tripod of three determinants. The first one is uh, good human capital. That is to say a, a high performing or high performing team. The second one is uh, appropriate technology. And the third one is adequate financing. So you've heard um, everyone, you know, a, a, a financing, I mean, uh, Austin touched on it, uh, um, Dr. Fatona talked about financing. So please let's talk um, adequate financing because this has been the bane of indigenous operators and the failure of most of the marginal fields are attributed to this uh, factor. So um, what can you tell us, Ifoma? And in Nigeria, Ifoma, the local banks are reluctant to use um, oil in the ground or maybe reserves uh, as collateral for lending. They'd rather have a, a producing asset. And uh, is this going to change? And if not, can you um, share with us some um, financing, um, um, what do you call it? Financing strategies. Strategy. Yes, because uh, this is usually the banana peel for most indigenous operators. If I may, please take it. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Demoran. And I'd like to thank the Energy Institute as well as the Petroleum Club for having me. I feel like the conversation is very timely and um, it cuts across all aspects, um, policy, operatorship, finance, and obviously an outsider's, an outsider's perspective. So to, to start off, I think I'll just go back to 20, 2014 as part of the shell divestment process about $5 billion was raised, um, debt and equity sources in this market and externally. So Nigerian banks funded and international banks and other um, traders and all of that funded as well. And FBN Quest um, was privileged to work and close two of those transactions. Um, the financial structure was, um, it was made majorly reserve-based lending facilities backed by uptake agreements, um, reserve accounts and the, and the like. And I mentioned this to highlight two important things. The first is that financing is not just about the source of the funding, that's who the party who's providing it. However, it's the whole framework, it's a compatible the whole framework. That is the contracts, the methodology on how these funds will be applied. The second thing, and that's what's on this slide now, is that it is the stage of business maturity that determines the finance that the business will be able to access. So we can see that in, in the exploration appraisal stages, um, you would see equity-based um, structures. However, as you move along um, the maturity um, to development and production, you begin to use reserve-based lending structures and then more balance sheet focused methods towards the end. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so now this is on the, I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of the policy and the crisis because my um, other panelists have mentioned that. So I'll just go directly into the structures. Um, could you go back? So the, the finance, yes, thank you. So the financing structure. So the first one I'm going to touch on is the forward sales structure. It's something that we're seeing now. And think about it as a series of contracts. So an SPV is created, and by an SPV I mean um, a special purpose vehicle that is incorporated to carry out that particular project. And then you have your producer on one end, and then you have your off-takers. So the producer is signing a forward sale agreement with the SPV to sell crude in the future. And on the other hand, your off-taker is going to sign agreements with the SPV to mirror the terms of the forward sale. So you have those contracts. In addition, you would have lenders who would be providing the financing. So that's the structure we're seeing now in the markets. And I think it's a viable structure. It's, it's, um, it's been used internationally, it's been used locally, and it's limited recourse. 
a key constraint here really is the, the hedging requirements because you're dealing with forward contracts. Um, so your hedging requirements do that. And by hedging, I mean the risk mitigation techniques that all producers use to mitigate against um, the, the falling price in, in oil. The next one I want to touch on is on contractor financing. That's number two there. And now we're seeing EPC contractors on these sort of large companies actually funding operations, right? And all, all you do is that they agree cost and recovery arrangements at the beginning, cost and return arrangements at the beginning. Um, so what is, what is um, key in this method, what is good is that you're actually transferring all your funding risk to another party. And you're able to benefit from the technical competence of, of, this, um, of this party. Um, a constraint here would be that not many EPC contractors would be willing to undertake um, production type risk, uh, but we're seeing it in the market now. The third option, and I touch on this, reserve-based lending. So now this is a method that has been used in this market. Um, Mrs. Demorian touched, um, touched on how you know, lenders are not really seeking to um, fund reserves in the ground, but I think this is a method that will continue to be used in this market going forward. Um, so what is really the reverse best lending um, structure? It's really a structure where the amount of the loan facility available for you is based on the value of the reserves in the ground. So what is key here is due diligence, right? You would need to ensure that the, you have ch um, checked the reserves and the, the, the oil and gas reserves on the ground. Um, what happens here is that it's, um, it, would, it would typically be, it would typically be fluctuating. Um, in terms of your redeterminations. So, so, so at times, if you get to maybe like a six month period, you would see that um, you would have to redetermine the borrowing base and the lender may actually request that you repay down this loan because your borrowing base is not enough. So your borrowing base is actually a sum of all your assets, both producing and non-producing. I would say that a constraint, a benefit of this method is that it's been used, it's been used internationally, um, it's been used in Nigeria, people are familiar with this method. However, for an operator, there are strict controls because it's, it's a sort of um, project um, type, type financing where you know, due diligence is required and extent diligence is required and it may be costly. Um, and the fourth one I've mentioned is just um, project finance and I'll just touch briefly on it. It's used majorly for the construction phase of midstream to downstream projects. But we've seen it in upstream operations as in a, in a hybrid type structure where people are funding, um, you know, it, it, would, it would be an amortized loan, but it, it, could, it would also be a reserve-based lending. So you're still funding, you're still focusing on the asset on the ground. Um, it's, it's, it's quite good because you, are, you could actually benefit, so no, still on, the, still on project finance. You can actually benefit from very long tenured sorts of financing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's risk shared. So there's risk sharing involved because you have a lot of people coming into the, into, the, into the funding bucket. So you can have ECAs, you can have technical or strategic partners, private equity funds, banks, and other institutional investors. Um, the constraint is that it's quite complex and obviously extensive due diligence will be required. So just going to the next slide. Um, my fellow panelists have, you know, touched on, you know, the marginal field and, you know, how, how we see it playing around. So I'm happy about the fact that, you know, there's a timetable in place. So what, what, what we want to talk about finance, I think financing is, will be very key. And what I've put in here is what we see, um, the, the way financing would go. I see a development type financial structure where people would rather share risk. So you're not, you're not going to get... Um, a whole bucket of Nigerian lenders or, or the like, I feel that you would get for the funding from you know, both the, the, the producer willing to acquire, technical or strategic partners, like I've mentioned in my previous slide, private equity funds, banks, and other institutional investors. And recall that there are two um, buckets of financing to be raised. So there's the acquisition debt, and then there's the debt, the, the capex of the working capital that you need to actually get to production. So it's very important. Um, I just feel like there would be a, um, a bucket of um, um, a mix of financings going into this marginal field round. I want to touch on the next slide. I want to touch on this, um, the key considerations that the producers should be looking at. The first one is independent due diligence. This is so important. Personally, I have an acronym I use and it is TELL ME, technical, 
environmental, legal, model audits, and insurance. It is so key to have your due diligence in place. You would need to get a reserves consultant to confirm the size of the and, and the, the level of reserves in the ground. Um, you'd also need to get your legal consultants, um, an auditor to evaluate the model and the like. So it's really important and, I, and we cannot hamper on this enough. Then uh, in relation to experienced operational teams and management teams, this, is, this goes without saying. A financier will be looking to see the level, the track record, how established the business is and whether they have good corporate governance. Then cost considerations. I mentioned this because most people go into the financing thinking, okay, well, it's just the amount of money I need to raise, but that's not it's it. And I'm sorry, but can yes. you just wrap two more minutes so that? Okay. <laughs> Please, okay. sorry about that. No, no problem, no problem. So just to touch on um, community development strategies, hedging requirements, um, and obviously your rob robust offset arrangements. I just list these here, that these are what key people will be looking to see in financing going forward. Um, the, I think the last slide is just about risk. Um, and there's nothing, I won't go into much detail here because I think most people know what, um, what risk is. And, and in project finance, risk is very key. And what lenders will be looking to do is to mitigate the risk. So as a producer, what should you be looking at? Put yourself at the point of view of the lenders and think about reserves. How can I mitigate the risk? You know, or construction, for instance, how do I mitigate this risk? Um, so I think in summary, just to mention that, yes, yes, there's COVID, there's a crisis and all of that. but People are looking, and financiers, and I say that financiers and investors are looking for projects. And they're looking for well-structured projects and projects that will give them good returns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ifoma. I think we should be ready for the next poll. Can you please display that on the, on the okay. So, um, what do you consider is the biggest barrier to foreign investment in the oil and gas sector? Country risk, enabling business environment, return on investment timeline, or lack of bankable projects? William, while that um, poll is going on, um, let me get to you. Um, William, thank you very much for your patience. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to be asking you uncomfortable questions. Um, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, FDI into Africa in 2019 grew by 11% to $46 billion define the global general slump for FDI. However, Nigeria's FDI shrank by 43% to $2 billion in 2019. It's also recorded that third quarter FDI in oil and gas sector was only $80 million. I'm not sure if this is correct. And uh, when we went through some extrapolation, we estimated maybe about $100 million in um, 2019. But I'm also aware that there are a lot of uh, transactions in the pipeline. So William, what is your opinion? What in your opinion is inhibiting or impeding FDI to Nigeria, especially to the oil and gas sector? And then what do you think we should be doing to reposition ourselves to become a better investment destination? We are hoping you will speak uh, frankly to us. <laughs> So William, just one second um, before you start. Um, the answer to the poll is out and everybody's saying that it's 91% thinks it's country risk and lack of enabling business environment. A mere 5% thinks it's return on investment and 4% thinks it's lack of bankable projects. So William, over to you. Thank you, Cecilia. I hope you can all hear okay. Is, yes. Is that okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so just to give you some perspective, I, I'm sitting in London today, but we run, I run, a, I'm, I'm not going to go through the slides actually, uh, uh, Yolanda or whoever's controlling them. I'm not sure it's uh, appropriate for this discussion. I think we're having a wider discussion now. Um, 
And we run, I run a business where I run a not-for-profit organization called Invest in Africa. And a lot of what we do is about trying to upscale uh, local SMEs, build the capability and capacity and get them competitive enough to be able to get into the uh, big projects of oil and gas, infrastructure, energy and, and agriculture too, actually. So we're not just an oil and gas initiative, but a lot of what we do is about trying to link local entities with the opportunities that an oil and gas or infrastructure project offers. And that could be right the way from holding their hand at the beginning of their journey and helping them understand what the industry dynamics look like, all the way through to slightly more sophisticated trainings, helping them access finance from banks or equity investors, uh, through to creating JVs so they can really scale up and, and taking them to become regional players, not just a domestic SME. Um, so that's what we do in, uh, in, in neighboring Ghana, uh, across in Kenya. We do that in Senegal uh, and Mauritania. Uh, and a lot of it involves oil and gas and mining. Um, so just to set the scene for, for, for all of you. Um, but we don't have a presence in, in Nigeria. And the reason I was asked to come and talk on, on this was, was precisely that. So the big caveat on everything I'm going to say is I have no Nigerian experience. Uh, I'm very much on the other side of the fence, you know, trying to see, seeing, seeing what I see in international media and news reports and hearing what I hear through the industry. So to answer your question, um, the reason we're not there and certainly the poll seems to validate that, is, is the kind of um, the industry image that you get from, from, from where I sit anyway, seems to be uh, continually quite negative. Um, and it's always the, the, the bad stories that dominate the media and the headlines. So it's always an issue that Shell are having, or it's always a tax issue, or it's always a licensing issue, or it's, a, it's a, you know, something related to um, a corruption, etc. And those are what seems to dominate the narrative coming out of Nigeria. And after a while, if you're not on the ground, they just blend into one kind of negative narrative that dominates your thinking. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, we've not looked at Nigeria for some, some of those reasons, country risk and the sort of perception that it's impossible to do, to do business there. Um, some of it's because it's just so huge and complex. We don't have the funding, the balance sheet to speculatively open and, and, and you know, hope it works. Um, so we've stuck to, 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 to what we know. Um, so I think there's a job to be done from the industry as a whole and, and the lobbying groups that represent industry to create a more positive move music around the achievements because there must be great success stories to be told. And there are fantastic domestic Nigerian oil and gas companies doing good business and doing well and operating regionally and even internationally that we don't hear about enough. So I think they need to be celebrated more. Um, I think some of the returns that are possible on investment need to be made more prominent um, so that the, the dominant theme is not always the negative one around uh, corru you know, risk, corruption, project delays, issues between IOCs and government, which is, which is what I seem to always see in the media um, and the reporting. Um, so that's my perception on, on, on the challenges the industry faces. Um, and then, did you ask a second question, Cecilia? Um, I was asking, you've actually answered the question because I was asking how do we reposition ourselves to attract mm -hmm. more funding because you're obviously not in Nigeria for some yeah. reason. Yeah. So yeah. what would we do differently to attract someone like uh, your fund into Nigeria? So I think the first part we've touched on already is, is about getting more good, good news out there and a more positive narrative around the Nigerian oil and gas industry. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do. That doesn't happen overnight. That'll take years to change uh, perceptions. Um, but you've seen on the poll how dominant that theme is. Um, so that, that needs to come down over time. That needs to be shifted back, back, back and more positive. But I think the second thing is, um, we haven't mentioned yet on this discussion, it's an energy transition journey that pretty much every oil and gas company is, energy company is going through. And I, I really do think the world has changed fundamentally. You know, it was already significantly changed by the environmental movements around the world last year. And then COVID has put those on kind of turbocharge. So there is an argument to be said that oil and gas will become so cheap that it will disincentivize the investments into renewables. Uh, but I'm not sure I buy that. Uh, I think that now to be attractive as an oil and gas investment, that it was an energy destination, you have to offer something in the energy transition space to investors. So you have to show them how is the how is their investment going to help them develop their energy transition offering, be that uh, even if it's as simple as um, carbon credits and offsetting mechanisms, all the way through to their project being a genuine example of energy transition. So it might be 100% gas play. Um, but I, I don't think you're going to find many. You'll find a smaller sort of boutique private equity houses looking for decommissioned fields, etc. But if you want big investment, they're going to have to have 
uh, an energy transition or even a renewables element to them that helps those investors argue to their shareholders and to their board that this is not a pure traditional old school oil and gas investment because I don't think many people out there can, can get those approved anymore. Thank you very much, William. Um, I apologies for putting you on the spot, but you handled no, that, that quite well. That's fine. Yolanda did warn me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, we have one more poll. Can we quickly run through that? Because um, we are going to go straight to question and answer. We have so many questions and we're practically out of time. So I'm going to crave your indulgence to run a bit over time because it would be unfair not to allow the participants to have at least one or two of their questions answered. So um, the last question is, the world will eventually recover. Do you think fossil fuels will still be relevant in the next decade to drive that recovery? So yes or no answer, kindly submit it in 30 seconds so we can move on to question and answers. Thank you very much. Um, we have so many questions, but I'm going to just take uh, one for each. We start with one for each panelist and then we take it from there. Um, the first one is for um, Mr. Olon Oshola, and it's from, okay, the Poll result is out. 92% think yes, that oil will still play a, a relevant part in um, economic recovery. Only 8% say no. So we'll come back to that. So um, please, uh, if the panelists can um, give me a few minutes so that we can run through some questions from the participants, um, I would crave your indulgence if you can please answer in maybe one minute or one and a half to two minutes maximum because we, we are actually out of time. So um, Mr. Lawrence, the first question is um, on the death. Just a second. Didi, can you take that please? The first question to Mr. Lauren Shola. Okay, it's from Yeni Akinsoya, and it, it says, are we likely to see the removal of death restrictions in the definition of marginal fields this time around, Mr. Lauren Shola? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Are we likely to see what? Re removal of debt restrict restrictions. That's if you have another zone that is maybe much deeper than uh, um, is shown. I think that is what he means. Yes, that, that's, that's seriously being, being, being considered. Um, and as a matter of fact, the, the guidelines, uh, and I know that one or two have been going around um, and moving around. Um, people have actually asked for that to be made a little bit uh, much more explicit um, so that um, at least you give a lot of flexibility for the operator to do that. I just wanted to say something on your last poll. Uh, the last poll, really, yes. So, Really, the problem may not be too much around the, the plane between the, the fuel tires. What will really, really be the problem going forward now will be oil fighting oil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Fatana, um, there's a question for you. It says, what will be the effect of gas flaring post COVID as regards the Niger Delta? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my understanding is that there's a very stringent uh, um, regulation that is in force 
regarding gas flaring. And I want the participants also to be aware that Nigeria as a country and NNPC as an institution have signed up to the uh, World Bank Global Gas Flare Reduction 2030 initiative, which in effect says that by 2020, 2030, Nigeria as a nation and the industry that is essentially uh, um, having an NPC as a big player will no longer tolerate gas flare. So this is the time. And uh, as a matter of fact, I would be surprised you cannot get a field development plan through to uh, approval stages if you do not have a very strong showing that there will be no gas flare in, in whatever it is that you're doing. So post COVID-19, I don't see any let off in the regulations that, uh, that, that prevents you from uh, flaring gas. That's okay, correct. thank you very much. Um, uh, if, if former, yes. there's a question for you is from Ifi Oji. She says, what actions are the private institutions willing to take for investors to repatriate their funds? And uh, do you think the efforts of the ease of doing business activities by the current administration has impacted on financing opportunities in the oil and gas industry? Okay, um, so I think on the ease, the ease, and ease of, ease of um, doing business, I think that, that that's really key um, for operators who are going in and seeking for finance. Um, because we talk about financing, we're talking about all the, all the costs um, that should be considered you know, in, in, in raising that financing. Um, so if you have um, good, a good regime, if they're telling you that the process is transparent, if your costs are, are reduced, um, this could obviously impact the, the investors and obviously reduce their costs. Um, for that. So, so, so that is, sorry, for the operators. Um, so that, that is key for the operators. Um, I think what is key really is the, the, in the entire process in terms of um, um, the, the universe. So, um, all the all the sources of financing that will be available. Um, I think it is key to ensure that we have a transparent process going forward. I think um, people are looking for well structured projects, and to the extent um, you know the government is willing and ready to putting the the right um, the right policies, um, like my fellow panelists have said, um, I think we could we could see some financing coming into the country, not just in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, William, there's a question for you, but I think you've answered it already. It says, can you be more specific? What is presently the bad news and what would be good news? But I, I think you've already talked through it. And um, they're, asking, do you, they're asking you specifically, do you expect energy supply and demand to return to business as usual in 12 to 18 months? Or do you think there will be a catalyst to shape the rebound in a more sustainable way? helping to reach Paris Agreement goals. I don't know if you or a farmer can take this. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is, you know, my personal opinion. I don't think there will be a business as normal again. Business as usual. I think the, the fundamentals have shifted so fundamentally. Uh, of course, there will be a pickup in demand uh, eventually. But I don't think we're going to go back to how things were. Um, and... Uh, I think eventually the environmental narrative and agenda will become very dominant again. Um, and there needs to be a, a rethinking of energy. You know, it has to move on from chit chat about transition and renewables and Paris agreement, and it has to become actionable now by the companies. I think their investors, their shareholders, their staff, their employees are demanding it. Whereas before that wasn't the case, they could get away with, um, you know, lip service and, and light touch um, sort of tokenism. I think it has to move on now. So I don't think you're going to, there, there is no back to how it was. Suddenly everything's fine and oil's at $50 or $60 a barrel and demand globally is, is ticking along. I, I think those, those days are gone. Um, but, you know, there will, be a, there will be a time when demand picks up, of course, but I don't think we're going to be back in that world anytime soon. Thank you very much, William. The truth is that we have so many questions, but... Uh, I think what we will do between Energy Institute and um, Petroleum Club, we'll curate the questions, get answers from the panelists, and post them on our various websites. 
I think that's the best we can do for now because we've um, overrun our time. So, but I want to leave you with uh, a word of uh, encouragement. The truth is that there is absolutely no frame of reference for what economic recovery will look like. The nearest thing to what we are going through is the Spanish flu, and we've been told that it took them two to three years to recover. And um, I dare say that despite what we're going through right now, if we look for it, we will find a silver lining despite our de desperate situation. Because we are living through exciting and interesting times. Technology really works. I mean, look at us here, you know, we're connecting with people globally and it's fueling innovations and creativity. The young people are actually becoming more innovative. And who knew that working from home would be productive? We are more connected than we have ever, ever been before. The current crisis will have a profound impact on our industry, long and short term. But the world will recover and will need to be powered. The question is, will oil have a, a, an impact or will it have a place in that recovery effort? We've seen from our poll that most people think it will. But let me leave you by reading to you excerpts from um, an article I saw, I think from Financial Times and uh, another one from McKinsey. And uh, it actually puts a positive spin on the industry. The first one says, under most scenarios, oil and gas will remain a multi-trillion dollar market for decades, given its role in supplying affordable energy. It is too important to fail. To change the current paradigm, the industry will have to dig deep and tap its proud history of bold structural moves, innovation, and safe and profitable operations in the toughest conditions. The winners will be those that use this crisis to boldly reposition their portfolios and transform their operating models. Companies that don't will restructure and inevitably atrophy. Another one says, the old order is gone and cannot be repaired, only rebuilt. The new world is a green field of opportunity. It is time for us to build something better than we ever had before. This will happen. New technologies, advances, changes in governance, and new ideas will be implemented. Problems will be solved. We will be okay. We will build and learn and create and grow. That is what humans do. It is what we've always done. All that remains is to decide what role we will all play. This is by Bruce Fenton. And with that, I would like to thank my panelists for their robust and insightful contributions. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank the participants for joining us. I would like to thank um, Energy Institute and Petroleum Club for hosting this webinar. And finally, I would like to thank Bristol Consulting for contributing to the concept of this webinar. Coronavirus is deadly. As we gradually ease out of lockdown, let us pay close attention to the health and safety guidelines. Please stay, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you for joining, God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. 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 Yeah, thanks.